is the most fun I've had staring at a hole in the dark with other men in a long time. When was the last time? I don't... Hey, everybody. It is uh, Free Range American. Uh, we're here just north of Pierce, South Dakota. Uh, I'm Marty Scovin Jr. filling in for your regular guests, so that you know the core four. But uh, we got Jack Mandeville. Welcome. And, uh, and Clint Romache. Hello. Yeah, you, you might know Jack from uh, his time in the Vietnam War, and you're also a single mother. Single mother, uh, Vietnam veteran, uh, best friends with Scott Stapp, mm -hmm. writer, entertainer, compulsive liar. Yes. Uh, most importantly, compulsive liar. I think that's... Absolutely. We need to really... That's the I mean, I could be telling everybody the truth tonight if I got real deep and you should not believe me, even if it's <laughs> the truth. And then uh, Clint, uh, notable, I mean, I got to bring it up, you know, got, got the fancy medal. Uh, not on oh, him. Oh, no. No, no, you don't talking about the with it? National, National Defense, National Defense, Defense Service or, Medal. I thought yeah. we were talking about the Army Commendation. Okay. Medal. Oh, you, no, Army Service Ribbon. Army Service Ribbon, yeah. Fruit Loop. Yeah. Um, and uh, working up in North Dakota. We're not, you know, you haven't just been spearing fish through the ice and not just been shooting pheasants. Man, you've been on some crazy hunts. This is not even, does this even register in the top five? Well, yeah, it does. Because I got down here today and we got pheasants down, walleyes in the freezer. I mean. This is peak South Dakota experience here. Well, First. the wind could blow a little harder and then I think we can <laughs> really, really qualify it for that. We got to talk about the temperature. This is even by South Dakota. This is normal by South Dakota standards, but it's only normal for a couple of weeks out of the year. Marty, I would love to talk about the temperature. Yeah. When we woke up at 5 a.m. this morning, after four hours of sleep, because we got in late last night. Uh, yeah, it was probably what, like minus 10, something like that? I want to say the temperature yeah. on the dash said negative nine. Okay. Below zero when we went out there, but the wind was blowing. I'd peg it at maybe negative 20, negative 25. So now around 11 p.m., after being out on the ice all day and hunting all day, mm -hmm. what do you, I mean, it's, uh, it's warmed up a little. We're, we're rocking minus five right now, something like that. <laughs> well, it's warm in this actual building. Oh, it's really nice right here. Yeah. 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 We got a space heater. We got the whole. Thank you, Stefan yeah. Brothers. Yeah. Stefan Brothers, they're hosting us out here. Uh, they're the ones that we don't, I don't think any of us know anything about spearfishing. <laughs> <If No. it, laughs> these guys just walk it's, into a shack and spearfish. Yeah. Uh, we have to sit there and stare. At I am no water. Poseidon. No. Yeah, but we've all we've all got a fish. Yeah, out of the hole. You know, pretty pretty successful first day on the ice. Uh, th I never I never anticipated it was going to be as exhilarating as it is to spear a fish. You get an adrenaline rush. It's really interesting. Yeah. It's it's very uh it's very primal. Yeah, it's uh I think that the, somebody's comparing it to bow hunting where you're sitting up in a stand and you're staring and waiting and waiting and waiting and then all of a sudden it happens and then, man, it's a huge adrenaline dump. Well, I wasn't here this morning though, but when you guys first got in the shack this morning, wasn't it like action right away? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we were 30 seconds in and had a walleye, which <laughs> set a terrible, unrealistic precedent yeah. for the day. Yeah. I, I, and that wasn't me or Jack per se. It was, again, the guy, like I said, they just walk into shack. He did the sit Paul... Uh, he did the same thing at the end of the day. Went to go shut the heater off in one of the other shacks. Walks in. Oh, there's a there's a cat or was it a catfish? Catfish, yeah, yeah, catfish. Yep. Just nails it. Just walks in. Oh, yep. Guess I'll just take one real quick. And uh, yeah, so he was a pro he did the same thing this morning though. He's showing us how to use. It's like a big Thanks. what eight foot ish pitchfork ish. Um, no, it's got to be. It's got to be at least. Three, nine, three times nine, my size. Nine feet, yeah. So yeah, nine feet, three times yeah. my size. And it just kind of sits there and you take it off a hook and then uh, you don't really throw it. You kind of like, assist guide. Yeah. It's really, you're just yeah. using your hands to point it in the right direction. And then it's okay. almost like you're like... And then you murder animals. You murder I was going to say that's what you, you tip them extra for. Yeah. Yeah. It's, uh, it's actually, it's pretty brutal. I mean, yeah, you're stabbing an animal to death out of the cold water and just throwing it on the cold ice. That's why and when I do combat, I prefer like old ancient medieval combat where yeah. I get to like stab a man in his chest yeah. and look him in the eye. I don't do any of that spears. pussy rifle stuff yeah. like you rangers <laughs> and you cav guys. I'm a freaking medieval knight and I know how to kill. Yeah, this is, you know, even it's, Stolen Valor, you know. Oh, I'm a master. Yeah. I've, I've actually, this is a stretch yeah, now yeah. reaching back into medieval I've, times. I've actually been doing real Stolen Valor for uh, over a year now. Yeah. 
Uh, what's the what's your preferred unit these days? So no, my unit is I'm a Air Force Red Horse. Uh, when I was on a USO tour uh, a little over a year ago, um, I got done with the show and the guy's like, "Hey, thanks for coming here. Here's my unit hat." I'm like, "Cool, thanks." Threw it in my bag because I'm like, "I'm not gonna wear this." Guess what? I got back to San Antonio after my two week tour serving my country by entertaining the troops, and I took that hat out. I'm like, "Oh, cool, a nice red hat. I'll go wear that out." And everywhere I went, everyone was like, "Oh, you were in Red Horse. You were in Red Horse." And I was like, oh, well, no, actually, I got this for free. So I got really sick of having to uh, explain to people why I have this unit hat in a unit that I never served in. So I just started saying yes. And then I went on Wikipedia and I researched the unit, everything they do, all their squadrons. So, yes, I've been telling everybody for over a year now that I'm Red Horse and I'm very proud of my unit. Well, is it really stolen valor? It seems more like you're doing advocacy on behalf of the Red Horse. I have nothing to offer any military community as far as positive image. Uh, I mean, you know, if you're promoting the unit history and... Oh, I'm the, very knowledgeable about the unit yeah, history. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is, you know, and they're, you said they're an engineer unit? Yeah, they're engineer unit. Yeah, I, they build runways and bridges. The, but here's my thing. We build runway, yeah, runways you and bridges. and yeah. your fellow comrades in the yeah. Red Horse yeah. Regiment. Very um, proud of my unit. Yeah. But honestly, like engineers, though, we were talking earlier on the drive back from the ice shack. Like, I think that engineers are one of the most unheralded units of the war on terror. Because Thank you. Like yeah. they they are driving around like, literally just blowing up IEDs, especially at like the right. high point of the Iraq that war. Certainly was yeah. one of our missions. Yeah. No. <laughs> like not not a lot yeah. that's like sexy about that per se, but like it's like holy cow, those guys had balls of steel. You had yeah. balls of, of Thank steel. You. Yeah. yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. Yeah. Was clearing pass for you, you boys on the ground. So. We Easily the most that, brave yeah. person in this room, I would say. I, no, I was just doing my duty to my country. <laughs> and I, I got, being an airman, obviously, like, uh, we were there, obviously, to assist the Air Force. But we were, obviously, working in support of every other branch. That's yeah. uh, In a unit like that, we are an extremely important tool. You know, we, uh, again, uh, CBs want to be us. Mm -hmm. uh, so, yeah. We're probably I mean, one of the most important tools in really the engineering world. really just kind of world. solidified, you know, one team, one fight, though, with that mentality. Absolutely, right? yeah. yeah. I care about all the troops. Yeah. Joint, a joint effort. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. Uh, speaking of actual real military experiences, I really want to talk about this, but me and you have something in common. Oh, uh, yes, we do. do you, now, know, hey, oh, Clint, oh, you have a Purple Heart, right? Yeah, I've got an enemy marksmanship award. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't get Purple Hearts, but Neither we actually got wounded, too. Yeah. Yeah. Emotionally training, or... Physically. Uh, physically, actually, okay. yeah. I get emotionally I wounded both. every day. Yeah, both. Yeah, yeah I get sure. emotionally wounded every day when I talk yeah. to Marty and he's yelling at me because I'm complaining about uh, how thin the ice is. <laughs> how thin the 13-inch ice, ice is. Yeah. <laughs> to, to Jack's credit, though, there was a massive crack in the ice today that we had to I, navigate around. I don't think there really was, though. Well, all I know, I the, think it was like a. You know a, what? A the red horses could have built a bridge and fixed that. Oh, you guys should have pulled that Wolverine out, out just yeah. laid that bridge. Yeah, yeah. yeah but uh, Marty and I are both uh, wounded warriors, not Purple Heart types, but wounded yeah. warriors nonetheless. No. Yeah. Warriors who were wounded in basic training. Yes, for me it was School Boot of camp. Infantry. Oh, School of Infantry. But is it, in the Marine Corps, that was basically just a. I mean, same thing with extension of it. Yeah. Army infantry. It's one station right. unit. It's all wrapped yeah. into. Yeah. Yeah, we both got shot. In base, in, yeah. But in, our, like, in our initial entry training. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Like, in my arm. Where'd you get shot? In my shoulder. Yeah. It was actually kind of a lucky shot. In an unlucky situation, <laughs> it just barely missed. Like, my, it, it stopped, just, the Wait, bullet path stopped just short of my spine. At, at what live fire exercise? Oh, goodness. There is a scar yeah. there. Well, we should each our story. I'm shirt off. Did so you, was yours a live fire? Uh, no, we were just at a known distance range on Main Post Fort Benning on the 200 meter berm. The range next door, there wasn't a berm. In, you know how most ranges oh, have yeah, a berm? They, separate in, they with had the just berm? a yeah. tree strip. So well, they I mean, were doing three to five second buddy rushes over there. I played a somebody, lot. Of somebody decided to, instead of put, uh, you know, as they went to go to do their three to five second rush, decided to flip their um, selector switch from, instead of from fire to save, save? Oh, to no, three burst? round burst. I mean, and then it's confusing. Hey, it, 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 that's one thing. Honest mistake, you know? Yeah, you're, a, mean, you're a new soldier, honest mistake. But... We then decided we're going to go pheasant hunting, I guess, and daddy shotguns it, but keep the finger <laughs> in the trigger well and then trip over a rock or a root or something and, and just, just crank off three doo -doo -doo. rounds uh, in the direction of, you know, soldiers uh, in their fifth week of basic so, training. So when this happened, though, what was your initial reaction thought? Like, because obviously there's a lot of safety protocols. Yeah. There's stuff. One would that, think. You know, One I mean, think, yeah. 
So you're in basic, you're at boot camp, and you get shot. You don't yeah. really expect to get Not shot. Not a place there. you expect to get shot. So at. In, where yeah. were you? Were you doing a live fire? No, you're just on the so flat before, range. Before, before I was Red Horse, I was in the Marine Corps, and uh, I was in the Armory at Camp Pendleton cleaning weapons. Yeah. Wait. Not as cool as yours or yours. Oh, straight negligent discharge. Straight up ND. Yeah. Whoa, in the Armory. Get, uh, you know, brass. Brass check coming off the range, get rotted Seven off the range. Seven rifles didn't get brass checks coming Seven off the range. Seven rifles. Yeah, they found six other rounds lodged up in those saws. Holy yeah. shit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Those were the olden days, right? Yeah. OSHA really wasn't a thing back then. The old breed. It's, yeah. Uh, back no, when I was in the old core. For for mine, it was uh, it was like a hot... I specifically remember because it was hot as balls that day. I grew up in South Dakota. I still... It's only week five. I don't think I completely acclimated to Georgia yet. Oh, and you're so, still dealing with the humidity. Oh, just, yeah. Yeah, I'm just trying to not go down as a heat cat on any given day at this point. Never mind be a competent soldier. Um, Get and, the ice uh, sheets. Man, I need the I, ice sheets. I felt like a, it felt like a, like a bee sting or something, but like a penetrating bee sting. I don't know, it's weird to describe it, but like in my back shoulder there. And something I remember, bit you. Yeah, I remember I pulled my BDU top up. This was right pre-ACU's. Era, right? This is 2005, oh, summer so 2005. It, it was still an accidental discharge before we renamed it to negligent. negligent yeah. I never knew. I thought they were always two different things. No, no. I, they're I, just the same thing, just one got renamed. Yeah, because it shouldn't um, be an accident. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it should so, be negligent. I feel it hit my shoulder. I pull my BDU top up, look, and there's like this perfect little cylindrical hole there, but there's no blood or anything yet. And I'm like, that's fucking weird. Like, and you're trying to like do the calculation on the fly of like, would a B make a hole? Like, no, what? insect would ever make a perfect little hole that looks conspicuously about the diameter of a five five. Well, I mean, round. growing up in South Dakota, though, I mean, there's not a lot of insects up here that Also, really... and you hear about the bugs in Georgia. Yeah. You know, like it's... So I'm so, sure you're thinking and centipede also is... Also, you're... Week five I've been one of those uh, Savannah cattywampuses. Yeah. You're, yeah. you're week five of basic A cicada training. just burrowed in and laid its egg for seven years. Who knows, right? Crazy things have happened, right? Like, so I, I'm just like, okay, I need to... Make sure this is right. But immediately, almost like after I do that first check, you can start to feel your shoulders start to throb a little bit, you know? And I pull it up again. And now there's shocked. like a, yeah, now there's like a, you know, a nice little half dollar size of, of blood that's starting to, you know, spread out on my BDU top. And I remember like, man, and the only drill start near me was this like salty fucking third bat dude uh, oh. who's now on Sand Hill. And um, just... Super not sensitive the dude. and just yeah, not the dude that you want to hear be all like, your emotions. Drill sergeant, I think I got shot. Which sounds you say that out loud, even to this day, it's like that sounds ridiculous. Who gets shot in basic training? Seriously, who the fuck? Besides me and you, who do I you, did. Yeah, yeah. Until I found you, like, yeah, fuck. So, anyways, you know, there's blood there, so it's like okay, whether I got shot or not, like clearly something is fucking wrong here. So I'm like, uh, drill sergeant. He like looks at me. I remember he's like, what? They're like, what, Scovelander? It was just like the most disgust. Yeah. It was a hot yes. day. He was miserable you're, too. You're annoying me with yeah. your... I'm yeah. sitting out here on a fucking KD range with a bunch of privates learning basic marks. Drill trip. sergeant, I it's think I'm bleeding out. 110 degrees out. Like, he's like, what? You know? And I'm like, Bill Sergeant, I think I got shot. And he just was like, he could, could not care. He's like, fucking... I remember like under his he's like, fucking privates. Like, and he's like, dude, drink water. Take know, a knee. Yeah. Whatever, like, and it was just like, whatever, you know, you like, you're hot, like, but you got somebody. Hey, I just want to say, you were being abused for the record. You look at that with fondness and laugh about a guy being like that to you. But if I, if I witnessed another human being uh, blow off someone who'd just been shot, like, I would have them kicked out of but the army. To his credit, though, he didn't realize that I'd been actually but been you, shot. But you told him you'd been shot. Yeah, but yeah, but his, his, his is a credit. We have to get not, revenge yeah. on this guy. This is what we do. No. We, we find him on Facebook. We find him on Facebook. We create a Facebook page that's a direct replica of his actual Facebook page. And then we go around the internet just talking mad shit about the army. We oh, take yeah. screenshots and send it to the head guy of the army and like, hey, this, is this one of yours? You better kick him out. And we ruin his career. I feel like you've done this before. Yeah, I kind of. It was like very detailed. You've had this plan for a while, yeah. haven't you? I'm just saying, if we want to get revenge on the guy let's, that almost let you die. Let's put a pin in that. Yeah, let's we'll circle back. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, you know, so we, uh, I tell him that, and he's like, you know, and so I'm like, okay, before I argue with the drill sergeant, I'm going to just make sure, you know. So I, Wait, well, so you're trying to cancel cult culture, this guy. Yeah, he's trying to cancel yeah. culture. He almost let a young, supple, innocent, pink boy die at the hands of <laughs> a reckless private. 
I don't. You're, you're, you're looking back in hindsight, as a pink boy yeah. before, huh? Yeah, that's, no. I'm just saying, Marty I mean, is a big stout man. I'm not trying to could, cancel that. It could take canceling a shot. Someone, canceling someone. To be fair, he was no, trying to build was, his confidence. If the drill yeah. sergeant would have said, if the off. drill sergeant would have said something like, uh, "Marty, I think you're fat," and then I tried to ruin his career. Yes, that would be cancel culture. But he was being clearly negligent in his job and had to be held responsible. Well, I think if we let the story continue, we I'm probably, sorry. Yeah, why am I telling your story for you? Because we have very similar experiences, okay, probably. Yeah. yeah. Uh, my anger is being projected on you, and <laughs> I wouldn't mind if you did the same for me. Yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah. Who buddy, are you buddy. angry at? Native Antarcticans. We should Antarcticans. roll back on that one. Yeah. Yeah. Ooh, yeah. Um. So, anyways, I du- I double check. I make sure that, like, okay, like. Now there's more blood. Like I'm legitimately more. shot. And- yeah, like this is, again, if I'm not shot, there's absolutely something wrong here. Like there's 100% something worth getting the drill sergeant's attention about. Like, so again, I, I do the check and then I look back over and I'm like, hey, drill sergeant, I really think I got shot. And he's like, and I just remember he starts like stomping over. He's only like 15 feet away, but like stomping over like fucking privates, like muttering under his breath. And then he got over and saw the blood. He's like, holy shit. Like, he was like, he was excited. He's like, holy shit, private, you did get shot. And then he, know, he did, like, again, told me, like, take a drink, take a knee and drink water. And he went on his little drill sergeant walkie talkie. It was like, hey, Sco- fucking Scoville got shot. <laughs> he's like, he was excited. But the funny thing, this is like 2005. So you got all these drill sergeants that are just fresh on the trail, fresh off oh, OIF one. Like, these guys are like, They've seen it. They literally, they, like, it's like every fucking private on the line, get your head in the sand. The other drill sergeants literally started bounding to our position because they were like, and I think in retrospect, maybe like, okay, if somebody got shot, you're not thinking ND or whatever, especially on a control KD range. Yeah. yeah. You're thinking active shooting. Yeah. Um, Army Columbine. Yeah. So, uh, or Fort Hood. They I come mean, over. Yeah. Fort Hood. That's a big touche for me right there, brother. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So they come over and, uh, and yes, look at it. And it's like, oh yeah, you did get shot. We take the top off. And at this point, like it actually really hurts. And I remember they had this like dude that was like a drill sergeant in training. Like he was like a drill sergeant, but he wasn't allowed to wear the brown, uh, brown, yep. you know, but he was like, you could see it hit at such a shallow angle on my shoulder. It entered right at my armpit and then stopped just shy of my spine. But you could see the bulge under my skin of like of the bullet. He took his Gerber tool out and just started like kneading it back. Like you were kneading a marble under bread, you know, like dough. It back to the entrance point, pulled out and like pulled it out, gave it to me. And it was like, hey, you can give it to your grandkids someday. And it's like, huh, cool. They'd already, and, then, and at the time, I'm like, oh, he's CLS qualified. Like, of course, he, I mean, surgery is perfectly within the realm of like somebody that's been to combat lifesaver course. So I didn't think anything of this. The other drill sergeants were like, ah, I don't think you should be doing this. Um, and then you like, you see like the Calvary, like all these like government. Vehicles, ambulances. Yeah, like that's when the colonel shows yeah. up. Yeah. Oh, and I skipped the part. Actually, the first person people that came out was like these two E fours that were on like main post Fort Benning medic standby Oops. for like range control. Yep. Like I don't think that these are like the cream of the crop as far as medics in the army go. Like maybe they were great, judging by the field dressing that they slapped on me real quick. I don't think that they were the cream of the crop. Um, but it was shortly after they arrived, and these guys were like clearly not prepared to be dealing with a gunshot wound, like an actual gun. They are used to like, hey, privates with over heat exhaustion. Yeah. So, you know, sprained ankle. I mean, it is a live fire range, so yeah. why not prepare? Yeah, exactly. But then it, they weren't there for very long. Then like the ambulances also have come in. They take me and, the, you know, we about wrapped this story up here, but they take me back and the surgeon was like, how did the bullet come out? Because there's clearly a gunshot wound there. <laughs> He's like, Dude, where's the bullet? Like, and I was like, oh, I got it right here. He's like, who took it up? It's like, oh, drill sergeant so and so. Oh, oh. And he him like, out without knowing it. No, I'm like, yeah, you did a great job. Don't worry, combat lifesaver qualified. And and the surgeon well, was like, well, Do you want to press scope. charges? And I'm like, for what? He saved my life, you know. Like, yeah. yeah. He was like, uh, I was like, I look, you know. They're like, well, at least what we can do is you, you can call home. And you're here in base training. Like, of course, I want to call home. Like, don't lead with you got shot. <laughs> Well, it's my, my mom throws me immediately off and is like, it's like, it's like a Tuesday. And she's like, what? Is there something wrong? You usually only get a phone call on a Sunday or, you know, something like that. And I was like, yeah, okay. Did you just so. go, mommy, I've been a bad boy. <laughs> I, yeah, I told her, I was like, yeah, I got shot. Don't worry, I'm not dead or anything like that. But yeah, and that led to, the, the deal they gave me is one, they were like, very concerned about me, like, or my parents, like, suing the military. Right. Like, they I just was kissing like, your ass. Dude, no, it was like, they tried to threaten me. They're like, you know, you can't, oh. you're not allowed to sue the military. And I'm like, dude, and I told the first time, like, he sat me down. I was like, 
I had a ranger contract. So all I want to do is the only reason I joined the army. I was like, I just can I keep my ranger you contract. You were too nice to the good. army in this case. I didn't know. I was five weeks into the army. Well, that's what happened to me too. I'm saying you were too nice to the army. Yeah. So they were like, yeah, you can keep your ranger contract. They did have to send me home on con leave to like heal up and stuff. But they were like, hey, if you go home without qualifying, because we were right before qualification, if you go home without qualifying, you're a day one restart when you come back. Oh. If you qualify, you get to restart at week six when you get back and just in a different company, you know? So I actually, I'm actually kind of proud of this. I went out, it took me like five or six tries because I had to shoot on the other side, but I did qualify as uh was sharpshooter is the middle one? It wasn't expert, it was yeah. one below expert. I was like sharpshooter. Expert sharpshooter marks. A open gaping gunshot wound like three days later. So I'm actually like really proud of that. And uh, yeah, then I went home and on con leave, and it was actually a pretty great 30 days of leave. Yeah. Because you come back home to here on South Coast, just an hour and a half east of here, and you got shot. You're the guy that got but of shot. course, if you're on South stars. Dakota, you're not the only guy that's ever been shot in that town. Only one that's, yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> Right? Shot stab. I don't even want to go down that road, okay. Jack. All right, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, but that was my experience. And I came back and I had a run of bad luck. I, I, that was, man, by the time I got through the, my, my initial entry phase, like I came back, graduated OSET, airborne school first week, I got food poisoning. I had to get recycled back a week, <laughs> go to RIP, Ranger indoctrination program, make it all the way to the end. It was like the day before graduation. I fought the fast rope tower. Like, fall off the fucking fast rope tower. Yeah, I get, like Private Blackburn. Essentially, yeah. yeah. Um, and then Ouch. get to 175, and the first week I'm there, I accidentally cut a fellow private's trigger finger off in a striker recovery drill with the winch. And, dude, at this point, and we were deploying like two You're months after I got there. Stacking up the... I was like, there's no fucking the way flags. I make it through Iraq or Afghanistan. Like, they're like, I can't make it through just regular training. Never without like getting catastrophically hurt or catastrophically hurting somebody else. Like there's no fucking way. Dude, five, five deployments, I didn't get nothing. Not a fucking yeah. scratch. You got Anyways, them all knocked out early. Yeah. That's my getting shot. You would think that that is such a unique story though. Getting shot in basic training. Yeah. You would think that that is so unique that nobody else could possibly have that experience. But then you meet Jack Mandeville. Well, it's pretty much the same thing except in the armory. Yeah. Yeah. But, but you were in initial, so you, initial entry training. Yeah. 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 I got shot in the armory. Got did, shot in my arm. Did you get to, how, how, like, was it bad? Did you have to, like, go to the hospital? Oh, yeah. They took me to the emergency room. They put some sutures on me. Mm. Yeah. It wasn't, like, terrible. Yeah. But then, yeah, they, they basically passed me automatically for the rest of the tests. Cause unlike the army where they threatened you, the Marine Corps is like, we got to cover this up. Mm. Yeah. We're just, we're just going to pass the kid. He won't complain if we just let him pass without having to work. So that's what happened. So, so you didn't have to go home. And then I went out and I uh, did some pretty heroic shit. I have 752 confirmed kills with kindness in the war. I was in the Kiss Corps, actually. The Kiss Corps. I know I said I was in the Corps earlier, but I forgot to specify. I was in the Kiss Corps. Mm -hmm. We go around. We took hearts and minds very seriously. Mm -hmm. And that was our objective was to go around, give kisses, let people know that we loved them. And we would just kill them with kindness. You know, when I was in Iraq, I always felt like, you know, I wish I had more soccer balls to hand out to the kids, but I could never get them. Turns out Jack was that was our soccer was, yeah. balls was, and, then the I, lights. and then after that, I left yeah. in the Air Force and joined Red Horse. Joined Red Horse. Yeah. Let's mm -hmm. talk about Clint's life. Yeah. Uh, not your military career. I, don't, I want no. to talk about your yeah. time as an oil man. An oil man? Well, you know, it was, it was fun. That's how was, you ended up in North Dakota. Yeah. Because you well, did like, what, 12 years of Army? It was 12 years of Army and, uh, you know, it came time to get out. And I'm a product of C's get degrees and college is not for me's. But, you know, C's in the oil field, like you are, oh, you oil are oil. Meat. Yeah. yeah. You're talking about oil, oil, I thought oil man, like, no, like not like pornography, no. like, oil, like the oil. No, no. no. Didn't oil know that field. was a, yeah. Okay. No. Okay. Gotcha. Well, I, I mean, was sorry. I was confused. Could be. No. On the right track now. Yeah. We're, no. Yeah. But so, so you, uh, you did army for 12 years. But you're originally, you grew up in rural California. Yes. So and, growing up, you know, in Northern California, um, you know, we grew up a lot like North and South Dakota, where it's small communities, uh, a lot of agriculture. Uh, never seen a California beach the entire time I grew up there, 18 years of my life. So my life experience had been, you know, milking cows and digging fence posts and you know, cutting alfalfa, baling hay. So joined the army. Very Dakota-ish. Yeah. Join the army at 18 years old, do that for 12 years. And it's like, oh, now it's time to get out. What am I going to do? Did you ever get shot in basic? 
No, not even close. Nothing, nothing <laughs> notable accomplished in his military career, unlike Jack and I. But you go to the oil field and uh, in North Dakota, I hear it's also cold up there. It, it gets chilly. It's about like here, only usually by north. About, yeah, yeah, another 10 degrees colder usually. Yeah. I mean, what, I, what I find most intriguing about you, you know, 18 years in... in uh, uh, NorCal, Central Cal? NorCal, like as close to the Oregon-Nevada border as you can possibly okay, so be. up there. Yeah. So, you know, 18 years is your most important formidable years, and obviously 12 years in the Army. Uh, you've had uh, uh, well-documented experiences there. Yep. Um, I got to imagine, e even though maybe the, 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 there were some cultural similarities going to North Dakota, you know, what I, I always tell people about you, I'm like, that guy really embraced uh, Minnesota sports culture. Oh, like yeah. right off the bat. Because I mean, you were in your 30s when you showed up to Minnesota and right off the bat, Twins guy, Wild guy, Vikings guy. Oh, so yeah, you also well, no, are into self-loathing and perpetual disappointment year after year. Why else would you well, move to North Dakota? Because work's good and taxes are <laughs> low. All right. And the Vikings Continue. will consistently not go to the Super Bowl. That, I mean, I'm not going to argue that point. <laughs> I, I did grow up in Northern California where I did not appreciate too much about the rest of the state. So I grew up as a Seattle fan. Oh, yeah. Because you're, you're, you're so, way up you're there. Yeah, so yeah, far yeah. You're I way mean, up there. I, Seattle was closer. It was closer to drive to Seattle than it was to uh, San Francisco. Really? It, uh, it's a long state. Yeah. Like, yeah, it is. You know, going down to San Fran. Uh, I never actually grew up. I never actually went to San Fran when I lived there. Um, would go down to like... My uncle lived in uh, Dixon, California, which was like 14 hours south. Wow. Near, uh, uh, the, oh, what's the meth capital? Uh, Barstow. Vic oh, or Barstow. Victorville. Yeah. Victorville. I know Victorville. Bar Spent yeah. a little time in there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like LA and San Diego just might as well be on the other side of the planet. From where oh, you yeah, are. absolutely. Yeah. I mean, even Sacramento. Yeah. You know, a lot of people are like, oh, Sacramento's NorCal. It's like, no, no, that's anything south of Redding in my mm. mind. Well, I was going to so say, bad. I imagine Nor NorCal people is like mountain people, or high, wine high, people. High desert. Yeah. Grew up yeah. in the high desert. Um, you know, I remember, you know, seven-year droughts were kind of common growing up. Went through a few of those. And that was, that was the, the thing with, yeah, growing up in that environment, going to the Army right away, knowing Army for 12 years, getting out at 30 years old. Yeah. It's like all of a sudden, it's like, oh, crap, what the hell am I... What marketable skills do I have in life? Well, I can pick things up and I can put them down and I can shoot a gun and I know how to dig a fence post. And you were, and uh, your people know you as uh, obviously you were a Cav Scout, but uh, you were a tinker for years. Yeah, as of when you went into the army. Initially coming in, that's uh, that was actually the quickest way to get to Germany. If I joined as a tanker, I could go to Germany right away. So oh, so you were gunning for Germany when you joined? Like oh, that yeah. wasn't just a random assignment. You were oh, trying no. to get there. Well, so part of it goes to, you know, my granddad served World War II, um, listening to his stories in Germany. He was a, a rancher farmer. He did rodeo before uh, the war kicked off. So once he got drafted, you know, he went over there as a combat engineer. Oh, um, yeah. part of the brotherhood. I like that. Well, he initially joined the CAV because uh, he used to ride barebacks and stuff. But of course, you know, we got rid of the, the horses and stuff and went to mechanical. Um, nobody wants to watch a horse die. No. It's and a lot well, easier watching a helicopter go down than a horse die. I mean, I, unless you work at the like chicken feed lot. I mean, I guess they watch those horses. I'm from the, the suburbs, so I don't want to watch a horse die. Okay. Well, you, you've never seen behind the scenes of the Kentucky Derby, I take it. No, and I don't want to. I don't oh, want that illusion of those beautiful animals. Do you like jello? And glue. <laughs> Just being a realist here. So let's fast forward. So grandpa, um, you know, he had great stories of, of his time in the military. And part of it was putting on uh, USO uh, tours for uh, rodeo oh, after yeah. the, the war died down in, in Europe while he was waiting to maybe. So go he was an Senate. engineer then on the USO. Yeah. That's crazy. I was on the USO then an engineer. You guys did probably a lot more, you know, a lot more heroic stuff, I'm guessing, though. Oh, no. your... oh, yeah. Red Horse? Yeah, we are 
to Lay, the spear. Laying those bridges. And yeah. we're I've one often of heard those... Jack refer to himself as the greatest generation. Oh, like, All by yourself. Yeah. yeah. He yeah, is the singular It's actually one of the nicest people. things anyone's ever said to me. Yeah. I think you're pretty great, you yeah. know? Yeah. I'm going to steal that line. <laughs> I, I can I build am. a whole freaking <laughs> thing around that line right there. Sorry. Keep so, a look out for more content from Jack Mandeville, yeah, folks. Yeah. Stolen from Marty Scovlin. <laughs> so, so growing up, listening to granddad's stories of, of Germany. And then uh, my oldest brother, actually, uh, he joined the army right away. Um, he spent time over in Germany uh, out of the 10th Mountain Division. So I just had this idea of Germany. And so at 18 yeah. years old, the only thing I've ever known is Northern California and seven-year droughts. And, oh, and, and Germany's th- relatively a lush land. Yeah, they, they've got like water. And, yeah. and mountains. And Trees. Like snow cap mountains. Rivers. And well, yeah. we had snow cap mountains, but that's you know. true. Touche. Uh, mm-hmm. that's my third touche towards you today. Oh, appreciate I'm that. 0 for three. I don't think it's a right. everything's a competition. <laughs> okay. So of course, so the 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 quickest way I can get to Germany after hearing all these wonderful stories of of growing up, of granddad talking about his experience, my oldest brother telling me about how great the beer is and the other things. Um if I join as a tanker, I can get a guaranteed assignment over there. And in my mind, like I said, I was not very good at school, but I could do some math. And I knew in Germany, the drinking age didn't matter. I remember this because at that time, they had like a recruiting option where you could do gar- guaranteed choice of station right off the bat. Right off the bat. If you chose up. certain... MOS. Yep. So I, I didn't forget. get a bonus. Yeah. You know, that was... You know, and this is still like... 99. Yeah, pre-9-11. Yeah, yeah, most he, people are just and joining. He, and for Marty was a recruiter, so he knows about ruining children's lives. I actually, oh, look, look, my brother's sitting behind the camera right now. I literally put my own brother into the army. That's some as wow. hardcore selfish shit right yeah. now. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, because you, yeah, you, you joined them. That, that's, ouch. <sighs> I mean, that's the ultimate blue falcon right there. Is, I mean, you know, had to make that quota. Yeah, make numbers. Had to make that quota. So you went in the late. And uh, how long were you in Germany before you went to Bosnia? Uh, I was there for two weeks. Oh my god! So yeah. you didn't really get to enjoy Germany. No, not right away. I mean, uh, the unit I went to was already uh, deployed down to Kosovo at the time. Um, so I got there, spent about two weeks, and then shipped out. But I mean, the big thing was I could go there at 18 years old, um, and I knew by the time I'd left, you know, would leave, I'd be almost 21. So. I got stationed back in the States. Could have the old... Uh, the traditional experience. The, the sip of the, the juices. Yeah. Yeah. But going to Kosovo right off the bat, though, is like a brand new private. This, oh, man, that thing... This so, was the late 90s. Things were still kind of hot over yeah, there, Yeah, Milosevic right? was still being a douche. Yeah. And, oh, wow. So you kind of went there for like the... When it was yeah. like in the news still. As far we as were, places to go as a brand new private in the army in 1999, like... That was the spot to be... I mean, we yeah. were a rapid deployment unit. We were so close to Hohenfels. Our, our unit was easy to send there and train and cheap so we could be ready for the Russians to cross the border at Folda Gap. Uh, I mean, for the first duty, assign- duty assignment to, to be in as a brand new private was amazing because the amount of training and mm-hmm. kind of realistic training. Like OJT. And you're still young and fresh and just everything's whimsical. Yeah. So it was great. You were to too dumb to know that you were actually in a conflict zone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. There was mass genocide going on in those borders. Yeah, but Nina had already sung 99 balloons. Yeah, she should have stopped were, right there when yeah. she pulled that song out. Why well, don't... What when, whenever artists sing about just peace and love, why doesn't it just cause it? I don't know why. Oh, is that a question or no? I, oh. I mean, I'm probably going to think about that for the next two weeks. I am going to really dwell on it. Yeah. So, how long were you in Kosovo? Uh, so that that first like first time there was uh, I was there for almost three months because my unit was already previous deployed. That's why I was two weeks in and then shipped right out. So for the unit, it was a six month deployment which was a long time back then. You know, because prior to that, I think, what, we had Haiti in the yeah. mid-90s. You know, we had Weekend Grenada. Weekend here, a couple weeks there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Desert Storm was a couple months in the desert. And of course, being right. this small you town. There, right, Jack? Desert Storm? Yeah. yeah. I looked like I was there, but no, I was actually very young at that time. Oh. Did yeah. you get the uh, trading cards? Oh, I did. Do you remember oh, the I trading remember cards? I was seven years old. That's a prime oh, yeah. age today. Oh, yeah. And you can make the map on the back with the, mm. the select ones yeah. out of the packs. Yeah. It's Schwarzkopf oh, and all those Storm guys. Yeah. 
It's a weird thing when you think about it. Yeah, uh, we had trading to cards. To fetishize over military leaders so much that you put them on trading cards. It's a weird thing. I mean, that was big back then, though. I mean, shit. Well, I, remember uh, the comic book industry? I was yeah, going to say, I had a healthy and, basketball card collection, yeah. you know? That was like, like going to be our retirements back then at that's right. six and seven yeah. years yeah. old. This, All yeah. those Don Russ and Upper yeah. Deck and Flair. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, can I interject real quick? I don't want to take us off the path. Uh, my, I have a beautiful uh, woman that I'm seeing, and she is not from this country originally. She's a citizen now, but she didn't grow up in American culture like we did. I, we were walking through a quaint little town called Fredericksburg, Texas, a few weeks ago, and I saw there was this. Um, it was like a, just a little general store area, but they were selling like novelty stuff. But they had original. 1989 tops baseball cards like in the pack still in the pack still in the package i mean they probably made a lot of these and never sold them so and it was only for like two bucks i'm like yo i'm taking a trip down memory lane i'm buying like a few packs of these did you open some of those might be worth like 50 cents a pop yes right i opened it bo jackson tell me you got a bo jackson no i just want i mean i didn't really get any big names the biggest name i recognized was dave winfield hall of famer Mm. but this is this is what really uh 1989 clearly says 1989, but she didn't grow up in a culture where baseball cards were a thing and you are able to notice these nuances. I opened the package and it's that, I don't know the material, but you know, uh, yeah, it's, it's like a foil. Yeah. And it's, yeah. A, yeah, it's like the, it's almost waxy. Yeah. But I open it 1989. There's a stick of gum right there. Yes. She takes oh. the stick of gum. Oh no. Boom. And I'm telling you, Just no hesitation. I didn't, I didn't even say anything to her. I'm like, she chewed the whole thing. Like nothing. Those things, if you were to go find 1989 <laughs> tops baseball cards, that gum's still good. Didn't affect her one bit. She's a skinny lady. I mean, noted. It, yeah. The That's, next time I come across. It really vintage. scares me what kind of stuff they were putting in gum in the 80s that it held up that long and caused no physical impairments whatsoever. I mean, it's super I mean, impressive. I'm sorry for going on that rant. It's just really freaked mm. me out watching that. Speaking of being freaked Kosovo. out, what was Kosovo, Kosovo like on that genocide? Yeah. side? You know, yeah. It, was, uh, yeah. it was one of those things that as a 18-year-old kid that grew up in Northern California that had to drive 45 minutes to the nearest McDonald's gets thrown in the middle of, and it's like, what the hell am I doing in this country? We're part of our mission someday. We're literally driving Albanians to Serbian towns and Serbians through Albanian towns. To go get yeah, they don't like each other. No, 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 no. It's like worse than Red Sox and Yankees fans. I mean, yeah, because they never genocided each other. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Big distinction there. But if they there, could, yeah. they would. Yeah. 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 And you know, just to get fuel for their tractors, and it's like, holy crap, this is insane. Yeah. He said, still pre nine eleven, still in this. Growing up in the '90s, and life is good, and we've got the Simpsons. Yeah, because that was general, and- generally speaking, a. Uh, very peaceful time. Peaceful mm-hmm. decade, for the most part. I mean, there was uh, never 100%, but compared to, you know, 9-11. 9-11 it was, 11, yeah. Well, and know. I think you think about, like, or as the, far as, like, if there were ever an altruistic mission for the U.S. to take on, going in, stopping literal genocide, yeah. and trying to I was, bring peace to... Like, that's a pretty... I think everybody can feel pretty good about that, right? Yeah. I always kind of thought it was because... Clinton was going through that impeachment thing with those blowjobs. And there was a little bit of a wag the dog thing going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I wouldn't argue that. Yeah. Could be. Well, if you guys really want to talk politics, uh, oh, right. Sudan was going through a huge genocide right around the same time. Why don't we uh, interject there? You guys want to speculate why? Nah, we won't do that. <laughs> but it's true. They, we didn't give a shit what was happening on Sudan, and it was really bad there. Yeah. But there was a lot of contrast of why we didn't go there. Okay, you know, I don't know the details. We're not here to talk details. We're here to make subtle innuendos about uh, America's, like, overall intentions, all right? And then leave mm, it up to the yeah. listening the audience, audience to make their assumption about what I was saying. Well, there was this uh, there was this scuffle in Mogadishu back in 93. Mm-hmm. And that may have yes. soured the taste of politicians as far as uh, military interventions on that particular continent. I don't know. I think that that's probably not too far off from the this truth. This is why Marty Scovlin is here. He's yes. the voice of reason. I'm just saying it could be one possible thing. Um, so anyways, you you yeah. get back from Kosovo and you're still in Germany for a while. Still in Germany. Did you uh, actually get to experience like, okay, I actually get to be stationed in Germany? 
Uh, I did a bit. Uh, like I said, we were a pretty uh, high deployed unit to be combat ready for the Ruskies coming over. Um, so we kind of had this schedule where it was like 30 to 45 days out in the box in Hohenfels and Grafenvier, qualifying Ooh. gunnery, you know, going, doing our little army thing. And then you'd get like two weeks off. Refit the vehicles, get some time off. So this was an insane op tempo for a peacetime army. Right. So what was really great about this is this is also also the time where like Rumsfeld was like, hey, if you have been deployed in the field for more than set amount of days, you start getting paid more. Mm. You guys Uh, remember this at all? No, I don't. Yeah. Yeah. So Rumsfeld had this big thing about like, hey, we've got these units that keep deploying and going to the field and we want to we're, we're thinking about army families or military families, families this, first. If you're out there. <laughs> what a premonition you, for fucking mid-aughts Iraq. Holy shit. Yeah. And I mean, we were literally 30, 30 days for this, yeah, this policy to hit effect. And then some yahoos, you know. So, and, and some, then you did two tours in Iraq. Yep. Two tours in Iraq. Were, you, were those both as tankers? So the first one was. Um, and you were in the tank? Yes. So uh, after Germany... We have this incident in our nation's history. Mm. Um, but at the time, of course, where we're going is over to Afghanistan. And I don't know if you've known this, but the Russians kind of dabbled around in that part of yeah. the, the and world. And they used a lot of tanks in they, that they, country. I mean, yeah. super successful with those yeah. tanks. In, in the mountains. The, yeah. In the mountains. And yeah. So we kind of knew that uh, probably wouldn't be going over there anytime soon. Yeah. Uh, so we pull another deployment to Kosovo because that's kind of the rotation we're on. So we go back in uh, late 2002. Um, it's supposed to be another six-month deployment. In the meantime, I'm on my bubble now that uh, I'm ready to either get out or re-enlist. Well, of course, I know we're going back to Kosovo. And as any smart soldier knows, if you re-enlist overseas, you don't pay taxes. Yeah, that, oh, yeah. that's just overseas, period. It's yeah, not yeah. just combat zones? I always thought no, that was it, just a combat zone thing. No, because, we, yeah, we were in Kosovo. So combat zone. Oh, it wasn't. Oh, okay. Combat. Zone. No, I'm not trying to denigrate. I didn't know no. like what the threshold. Do you know of, how yeah, many veterans to, yeah. of Kosovo that, uh, there are in this country? A lot. Yeah. I'm sorry. Wait, in this Is, in this room, or it was a shameless opportunity for me to try to make you feel bad because you made me feel bad earlier today. Let's move on. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I didn't serve in Kosovo. So, My bad. I literally was in middle school. Sorry, I couldn't be there to have your back, Clint. You know. You probably would have gotten shot in basic anyways and been delayed. Probably, or, yeah. That, that's just, well, yeah, I, I just, apologize. It, Marty was just a couple years away from getting shot in basic. Yeah. At that point. Mm-hmm. So I re-enlist because, you know, in Kosovo, tax-free, and the biggest bonus at the time is Korea. Because who doesn't want to go to Korea? I mean, let's be honest. Uh, so I re-enlist, go to Korea, thinking that, well, we're over in Afghanistan. My days of maybe seeing combat, um, probably slim to none. We're not going to send tanks over there. And this is still in the days where we're like, man, this is no way this lasts more than like a year or two. Yeah. And, like, you know, there's some speculation Saddam's being a fucked hard again. Yeah. But of course, we've been talking about that since the end of, you know, Desert yep. Storm. Well, it's, you know, time for me to report to Korea. So I come back. Uh, well, that was another six month deployment. And I got pulled back at five months so I could PCS and go to Korea. And I was actually home on leave. In Northern California, driving from Reno, Nevada, because that's the closest airport growing up, driving up to where I, I grew up, three-hour drive, listening to the AM radio, because that's all we really get out there, to hear the invasion, the shock and awe go off. Yeah. And of course, it's like, crap. I missed my opportunity. They used a lot of tankers for that. They did. And in fact, uh, we had a lot of train up going into it, where uh, we were the first, uh, first infantry division at the time and uh, uh, 361 Armor, the unit I was with, we actually were the first unit to go train in Czechoslovakia since World War II. Because initially our mission was going to be attacked through Turkey. Mm-hmm. But, you know, geopolitical. 
political stuff. I only aside. attack turkey on Thanksgiving, brother. Oh, my God. Yeah, that was gotta, another one of those like interesting little <laughs> things in history. That was, I mean, I, I did appreciate that joke, but <laughs> I, I'm like going down the road. I just remember that time specifically because there was like this whole conversation about they're going to come from the south, they're going to drop from the north from Turkey, and then a big, massive airborne drop on Baghdad and everything. It really it didn't just, quite go down that way. Turkey actually turned the ships away. Yep. And it was like, okay, yeah, sorry. Right. Sorry, so so they are a sovereign nation and they get to do whatever they want. And the United States, we must respect the sovereignty of others. Sweet. I mean, so I had to. You just get me lost for words. I'm sorry, man. (laughs) So I get to I get to Korea, and of course, I'm thinking to myself, "Crap, I'm in Korea," which Mm. most of us know is a hardship assignment and a already deployed location. And I've got, you know, since I re-enlisted, I got 18 months to spend over there. And I've got a guaranteed return assignment to Fort Irwin, California, thinking, well, that'll be my last wow, hitch in the had Army. just a couple of doozies lined up one right after another. I, I like to embrace the suck. Yeah. Yeah, Fort Ir- Irwin and Korea and Kosovo, it sounded like it sucked. I had Germany there. I mean, well, yeah. Yeah. You always had that, that, that your old darling Germany always my had old, her to fall back My on. old Fraulein. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Never forget my, oh, well, speaking of which, so Graham Graham, love Graham Graham to death. Mm-hmm. She did ask me before I did go over to Germany, right before I was shipping out, that if I did ever see anybody that looked like my uncles or my mom, to let her know. She's still all these years later wanting to see if, if grandpa, grandpa was, was, you know, being, yeah. Still grandpa. curious after all. Women yeah. do not let things go. No, they don't. <laughs> no. <laughs> They've been holy, married holy. in 60 years like, How, at that point. You, I mean, you've been out of the it's, army, not to jump around too much. You've been out of the army for a decade now, right? Pretty much. Yeah. But yep. nine. Uh, no, uh, not, right at 10. When was the last time you've been to Germany? Did you ever yearn for Germany? So what's interesting is one of the guys I went to basic training with is now like the head hondo. Command Sergeant Major over at uh, Honefels. Oh, really? And Rodney has asked if I'd come over and talk to the the unit. Um, but of course, with COVID and stuff, right? Haven't been able to put that quite on the calendar yet. Which is something I'm super excited to do because my oldest daughter was born over there, and so hopefully we can get this date set up maybe this year, and then I can take my oldest daughter back over and oh, that'd be awesome. Have a, a pretty sweet trip with her because it say it she was born over there and. She got to see a lot of Germany without her dad. Yeah. Because I was yeah, either in Kosovo mm-hmm. or Oh, out so in she the box. remembers growing up there. Uh very very vaguely. She was what just going on three by the time we left. Okay. But I just want to drive her over and be like, that's the hospital you're born at. Yeah. I had to uh, drive there. Yeah, I think there's some like American kids over there go hang out. I got some beer joints I want to get reacquainted <laughs> with. That home calls oh. area is pretty cool, though. You're like right in the heart of Bavaria. Yeah, it's, like it's a, yeah. it's a cool that unit over there. Like uh, we did at Coffee or Die, we did an embed over there with the Wolfhounds uh, that are at the JR. It's called the JRTC Joint Readiness Training Center. I don't know what it's called. Now. Yeah, yeah. It's the, they do all the massive. It's like NTC, but in Europe. Yeah, they do these massive training rotations through there. It's actually super impressive. But yeah, we did one of their armored units that they have there. They all they wear like they don't wear American uniforms, anything like that. They are a full on like op four, but they're the only deployable op four unit in the army. They've got multiple rotations to Iraq as an op four unit. Not obviously being do, yeah. do they get well, to wear like op, what are they wearing? Like Hawaiian shirts while they're doing their It's tank? like a yeah. kind of like a pseudo European yeah, military yeah. sort of kind of that they're old American? Eastern. Yeah. 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 Oh yeah. Really? And they yeah. and I when I was this there, is their duty uniform. It's not like yeah. they only do this during training. Like this is their That's duty they wear uniform that they wear every day in the morning, back in first formation. Yeah. Huh. When I was there, they still, you know, we they stole a, a lot of uh, Soviet vehicles. Yeah. So when we'd go and fight against them on uh, the tanks and stuff, they'd be driving T seventy twos and BMPs. BMPs. And, yeah. Like, ah, not it's that fucking wild. Can man. you imagine joining the army? They're like, hey man, you don't need to go fight the bad guys. <laughs> You're gonna be the bad guy. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> all the all the pictures if you just do one enlistment and stare and all the pictures you have of you in the army are in this like yeah. made up uniform yeah. it like, looks like your stash talk, stole stolen talk valor. about stolen valor <laughs> accusations right there right oh man back in 81 when the wall was still up I snuck yeah. over to East you know Germany and stole this T-72 and I got it parked here in front of my unit stuff like that cool guy stuff cool guy uh, oh. uh you, yeah. did, you did Iraq and then uh, as so, a tanker. Yeah. So that first deployment comes out of going to Korea. I was there supposed to be for 18 months. Uh, coming up on 15 months. And the war in Iraq, of course, had kicked off in 2003. This is 2004. We're a little short on guys. And uh, we get the call in Korea that, to activate a unit to, to deploy over. I get pulled up in that. So my first deployment actually came out of 2nd Infantry out of Korea to go from Korea to Iraq. And then we ended up, after being over in Iraq for 13 months, uh, found a spot in Fort Carson, Colorado to come back to. Oh, so I got to bring Korea tanks <laughs> to Iraq on my first deployment. And it was pretty awesome. Um, At least I bet the heating systems worked, right? Because if you're going to be stationed in Korea, they make sure like the heaters work in those things, right? Uh, for the most part, yeah. Yeah. I mean... It was, I think, in the wintertime, a, a, a deadline, but it could all, always be circle X. And so you did, like, tank guy stuff in yeah. Iraq. Oh, absolutely. So uh, we got actually uh, attached with the first of the 506. Uh, we're an armor company attached to literally the lightest airborne guys you could possibly be. Mm -hmm. We're stationed in uh, Habania, Iraq, which was right outside of TQ, which is where all you Marines were hanging out. I wasn't there. I know you weren't, but... You guys would get pissed because that was the closest. I mean, like, you guys, that was like 15 years ago for me, man. I can't be associated with uh, what uh, those guys are. I didn't piss on any dead Taliban. Okay. I don't want to be associated with every Marine that ever ticked you off, Clint. <laughs> <laughs> you guys would tick us off because you'd always get mad at us because we'd drive our tanks over to TQ and use your BX. It was, will, so, it, will it make it easier if I just call myself just park an ex-Marine so you can leave me alone? All right, former. I'll be an ex-Marine. Okay. And so just so you can never give me shit about anything a Marine ever did again. I'll be an ex-Marine. I'm an ex-Marine. Okay. Sorry. So you were in Abrams Tanks in, in Iraq. In Iraq. Attached to a light infantry unit. That so, was smack dab. So we were yeah. right outside of uh, Ramadi and Fallujah at the time. Oh, Which wow. is uh, a interesting place to be. Oh, hot. Yeah, yeah, it was hot yeah. that time. Yeah. yeah. Not a boring deployment, no, I imagine. not at all. And the, um, the interesting thing about this, too, is this whole putting... Abrams tanks with light infantry. It was like, you think it, it sounds ridiculous on its front. Oh, we had a, a, a tank platoon from the fourth ID attached to us. Those guys, they were like in the middle of like an 18 month deployment or something like that. But they knew my first deployment was in Baghdad. They knew every like back corner alley. alley. Of, Man, those guys would fly down these like Iraqi <laughs> alleyways in Abrams tanks. You were just, trying to keep up with them and they would just like, oh, you need to breach that wall. Roger. Stamp yeah. like they were Traverse turret and just awesome. boom. Like, you want to do That's, Iraq, do Iraq with a tank <laughs> platoon. Like, that is a fucking badass. Well, and of course, when we first get over there, there's that animosity between armor and infantry. Yeah. And of course, the shit talking back and forth. And, you know, it was- Why like, would anyone talk shit about tankers? Because we're lazy. No. Mostly fat. But that, no, but it's just, it's such lazy. a ridiculous concept that you would even find anything wrong. Like, it's a big, beautiful, almost impenetrable vehicle that can do a shitload of damage. How can you not respect that kind of thing? I think a lot you of gotta, people respect the equipment. It's yeah. like the A-10 of the ground. Yeah. People. <laughs> oh, the people. Yeah. I mean, oh, it's a dirty culture. Yeah, you know, it's got its own stigma. Okay. Of course. I mean, you get a little bit removed from it and it's like, oh man, like oh, those, especially like you'd be around like actual tankers. Like, oh, those guys live and breathe out of that fucking tank. Like, I mean, that is a the hearty is, yeah, lifestyle. Death, death before dismount. Yeah. I've had drivers that literally did not get out of that driver's hole for weeks at a time. Just yeah. down there pooping. Just down there just pooping, pooping and peeing and <laughs> yeah. eating this their food. Yeah, this is pre-wag bag too. So they were they're doing it the old-fashioned way. They're like burning their poop inside the vehicle, right? Yeah, slinging the bags out at high speeds. And Far enough, okay. Yeah. So that yeah. was your first deployment, Tyra. Yeah. And then you, went, then you went back again. Were you still a tanker? So coming back. Of course, now we're making a change again because, you know, the military makes all these, like, fast, mm -hmm. amazing changes. Always well thought out. Always well thought out. Well, you know, calculated. And we get back to uh, Fort Carson. It's around the time that 
General Sinzeki is like, hey, fuck the PC. Let's all go to Black Berets and get rid of tanks. Mm. So, Very popular in the Ranger community at I, the time. I know. It was, that was a it hit, was a, I'm it was sure. A hit, yeah. Which, of course, yep. all of us salty old armor guys are like, oh, well, originally, armor yeah. had the Black Beret back in. It, it, was, the, it was the ultimate, well, actually. Well, actually. Yeah. Hypothetically speaking. <laughs> <laughs> So it, one of your own came to power and uh, disrupted the whole system. You guys were okay with that. I didn't care either way. Okay, I think yeah, most yeah. of the army thought the black beret thing was like a dumb because like they're like I gotta shape a beret now. Like a PC is so much easier. Yeah, you know? yeah, you gotta shave it and yeah, also. Oh yeah, that's a lot of extra work. Yeah, and oh, yeah, and especially you don't just slap it on your head. And especially being a former tanker, super yeah. lazy. Yeah, you don't want to deal with it. Oh, yeah. So we get back, and of course, they start this downsize. The armor branch, you know, is going to get rid of some of the tanks. But since the armor branch is also incorporates... So what, what, this is 2005 at this point? Uh, going on 2006. Oh, yep. okay. Coming out of end of five, beginning of six. Gotcha. Uh, so I get told that, hey, you're a E5 promotable, about to be an E6. We don't really need those guys on tanks anymore. But what we need is some Cav Scouts. They still want you to do Army. They do. And they're like, so we're going to volunteer you that you need to go to Fort Knox, Kentucky and reclass. That's a, quite a cultural change, I would imagine. It, it was. And it was amazing because I didn't get a reclass date until after being a Cav Scout on a second deployment. Oh. So what you're... You, you, the deployment that you're known for in Afghanistan, you weren't even in a No, this is second Iraq. Okay, okay. Oh, second Iraq. Second Iraq. Iraq. So okay. the, that deployment, I was still technically a tanker. Okay. Even though I was a senior scout in a scout platoon and went through a 15-month deployment of that to come back. And that's when they finally sent me to skill level 10 reclass school. And you as learned a staff sergeant. what a calf scout was. Yeah. Even though you'd already been doing... And just so everybody knows, skill level 10, that's brand new. That's getting private. shot. Yeah. And so, <laughs> guy who's been to Kosovo, been to Iraq, been to Iraq <laughs> again, is a staff sergeant at this point. Staff sergeant He's like, time. hey, we're going to go back and teach you basic ground level. Like, And then they made you a platoon sergeant. Right? I, I No, I filled in for a while. Okay. I mean, yeah. It was kind of... Yeah. I mean, yeah, platoon sergeant sometimes it's just, you just rotate it when the actual platoon sergeant wasn't there, you'd step in. Somebody's um, got to do so, the job. Yep. Yeah. So going to that Afghanistan deployment, that's what happened that day was my platoon sergeant was home on leave. Oh. And of course, the rotation takes so long what to a, get... What a time to be away on leave. Yeah. Uh, pretty intense thing that happened. Yeah. Uh, they've written some books about it. New York Times bestselling books. New, New, oh, yeah. Hmm. Oh, is there any Just, plugging you'd like to do right now? Yeah, I'd like to tell my uh, English teacher, Miss Gregory, that failed me in my senior year of high school to go fuck off because I'm a New York Times bestseller. 12%, 12 buddy. That's what I had. I, yeah, and you don't want to be insulting with the whole the old adage that the, those who cannot do teach. But I do remember, I, I remember my old English teachers. These were like, old spinsters that would have, they just had shelves of books, but I'm like, you've never been published. Why are you freaking get on me about this kind of stuff? Proper, like certain, like they obsess about, you know, grammar can be fluid. Yeah. Um, I got, I actually, uh, you know, as a, as a professional word rearranger at this point in my life, I actually have to give a lot of credit to my English teachers in high school that were very patient with me. Like big shout out to Mrs. McClory and Mrs. Klein. Like they were, uh, I was a little bit shysty. In high school, um, I don't think a lot of people had me pegged as future writer. And uh, there was a lot of things. And because I am not college educated, uh, as I started to get into this, it was like, oh, man, those high school English classes. That's about all I had to work with in the beginning. Yeah. And they they actually they did do really cool. Like, I remember we read great books and they actually were they were really good teachers. I had a very positive experience with I got my an, English teachers. I got an F for doing a book report on Spy versus Spy. <laughs> From Matt. Well, they actually published an entire book. <laughs> that was it's, it's all, of all the old comics, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> she gave me an F for that. 
<laughs> hey, what do you want? Uh, what would you like to do? A farewell to arms, Huckleberry Finn, uh, any Vonnegut? Yeah. No, I want, a, I want a yeah. comic strip book. How about the far side? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, uh, the tank tanker thing started to make sense yeah. now. Okay, all right. Yeah, um, yeah but you uh, you wrote uh, we. I mean, if we were to talk about Clint's time in Afghanistan, we would have to be here for. Uh, I actually hours. am genuinely excited. So Jack was telling me we were talking about you a little bit on the way up, and uh, he's telling me about like how, okay, so after this major battle that you guys have, something like fifty percent of the platoon is now not there. Uh, you have to backfill that because you guys were. Young into the deployment, right? Yeah, three months so, in. So um, now you're you're a senior NCO in this platoon, and you got to deal with, okay, we're still out in bad guy country, and now we got a bunch of brand new people to not just integrate into the team, but bring up to speed on what's going on here. And ho- oh, by the way, hopefully not any, you know, keep them from getting hurt or killed. Like, what is that like? Just from a leadership perspective, like, hey, half my organization just came in overnight, and I got a. You know, that that came down to Lieutenant Bunderman, um, another Minnesota boy. Oh, yeah. Where's abouts? Uh, he lives up in, uh, what, north of Mound now. Oh, okay. he was born and raised. Not too far away from where I grew up. Yeah. Blaine. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Hardy grew, folk that come out of there. He grew up with That's the suburbs. It's not that special. Yeah, he grew up at the snooker table. Yeah. It's, it's, oh. so it's the suburbs. Yeah. Well, you're pretty hardy folk. We saw that today. <laughs> he was he's a champ on the ice. Hey, man. We can talk about that in another show if you'd like to. We're talking about Clint right now. He speared the fuck out of that fish. That's though, right. So. Yeah. I got my Minnesota card back. Yeah. We yeah. spotted that thing right yeah. away, though. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Let's just keep uh, talking about how great I am for the rest of the show. <laughs> I was too yeah. busy drinking Bush but, Light but. to realize. <laughs> so leadership in Afghanistan, doing this over, yeah. So, yeah, we get, you know, we get there. And, um, you know, our battle happens three months into this 12-month deployment. And, of course, you know, we lose critical, I mean, just, you never want to lose anybody. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not trying to downplay that. But coming out of our platoon, you know, we lose three team leaders. Mm-hmm. Just critical personalities. Uh, Stefan Mace, you know, he's one of our lower enlisted. But he's really kind of the just spotlight of the, the lower enlisted guys that the rest of them can kind of rally around. So we all of a sudden overnight have lost all this dynamic. And... Yeah, you're looking there and it's like, crap, we've got nine more months left. Mm-hmm. So we start getting replacements in um, and they send them pretty, pretty quickly. Um, and in fact, we get a couple of guys in that are 11 Bravos, not even 19 Deltas, you know, because we're you trying guys to- are essentially fulfilling an infantry mission in Afghanistan. Like there's, you're not using tanks in Afghanistan, right? Oh, no, no. It's this is, very, very light. You were um, up in the mountains. We, yeah. you know, we ended up with our new mission following on. Of course, we started getting a little more mobile with uh, the Humvees, the MRAPs, uh, sure. doing a lot more driving around stuff. But I mean, immediately overnight, it's like, how do we, how do we backfill these? And with Lieutenant Bunderbin, you know, like I said, just an amazing, amazing man. Um, we're sitting there and we're just kind of, first things first is we got to get back on the horse. The longer you let these guys sit here and not go back on mission, the easier it is for them to not go back on mission. Yeah. Uh, the next critical Which thing. It's a hard call to make, but it's a, it's a, it's, it's a reality. It's a, it's yeah. kind of a dick call to make. Cause you want to sit there and let guys kind of, you're there, lick their wounds and stuff. But you know, we kind of pulled the guys to the side and it's like, look, this bad shit just happened. Mm-hmm. Nothing we can do about what happened a couple of days ago. Um, we've got nine more months left. Uh, let's get to the end of that and worry about yeah. what just happened got to stay focused. If, if we're distracted with that shit, these nine more months ain't going to, that can make a difference. Yeah. Because if your head's in the game there, you're not focused on what's right here. Uh, so that was a big push with getting uh, the guys that were remaining um, to refocus, get back out on the horse, to, to sit there and I don't need you to, I don't need you to be the next Arn Gallegos and fill his shoes, but I need you to emulate his leadership. Mm-hmm. Um, and show that to the rest of the guys. Here's an opportunity for everybody to step up. Yep. It, yeah. it sucks that it comes yeah. in, the, in this form, um, but stepping up is still stepping up regardless of if it's someone stepping away for another platoon deployment, uh, follow-on unit, or permanently. Stepping up is stepping up. 
getting those new guys in also was was really critical because regardless of if they were with us th- that day or not, they're with us for the next nine months. And just because they weren't there that day doesn't make them any less. They're not, you know, the, the thing I hated to hear never would allow it to be said is, well, you weren't there that day. You're, you don't know what we've been that, through. That's and crucial. It's, that is such a slap in and the it, face because you can't get someone to buy in to your team when they already know from the get, they will never be accepted. Mm-hmm. Um, so never allowing that to even come up. Yeah. Uh, building that, that team back. That probably again. was one of the strongest elements of getting back on track, I would and imagine. Not an easy thing to, you know, because I'm sure guys were feeling that on the inside, even if they weren't allowed to say it's it on the out loud. Is, it's, that's a hard thing to overcome. That's a hard emotion to get past. But what's great is, I mean, you know, hindsight's always 2020. Looking back now, I mean, we've got a platoon text that goes on. And sometimes when I don't check it, there's 200 messages that have flown back. Yeah, it's a forth. lot of dudes to be talking back and forth, man. You I know, can't even handle three people at once. There, there's 18 guys on this thing. And out of those 18 guys, they're the replacements too. Mm-hmm. You know, and to see that the, that nine more months we went forward with them, they're still... Still the majority of the deployment. Yeah, and exactly, I'm sure y'all, yeah. uh, were, you know, I would imagine y'all got into some fights together in that time. Yeah, that was, I mean, it wasn't a cakewalk coming out of there. And that's what a lot of people don't understand. You go through that one bad day, you don't get to take your ball. Funny thing about war is uh, it it, continues. Yep, it just keeps on chugging along. That's unfortunate because I would imagine uh, the general public, they don't, that's what they, yeah, they don't understand that. Like it didn't just stop after this thing that, you know, the the fourth quarter wasn't over right then and wasn't even the fourth quarter. Yeah, right. That was like just a, that was a pretty intense first quarter. And yeah, it was continue through. And mm-hmm. you right. can just make football analogies for really serious shit all day. I, I mean, you yeah. know, the offsides was just ridiculous <laughs> when they breached the wire. And yeah. Man. and where yeah. were the refs, refs on all that? Yeah. Come on now. <laughs> the, the pass interference when that drone iced up and crashed <laughs> into the mountain was. <laughs> You know, got to yeah, hand it to the dude. supply guy though, and, throwing yeah, BS seventeen. I don't want to flag. I don't want to. I, I don't want to uh, go too off track. But that'd be a good coffee or die thing. I'm pitching to you right now, okay. live, by the way. But <laughs> it would be talking about a famous battle, like a like Gettysburg or yeah. battle, but but only doing it in football analogy. Yeah, is that uh, too smart? Well, in the name of journalistic integrity, I just like to note we are not live right now. This is a pre-recorded episode. Oh, so I could just talk really intense. I could speak for all of Black Rifle and say yeah. whatever I want, and it could get cut out. Uh, I, I think I'm not even sure you're going to make the final cut of this episode, Jack. So. Oh, okay, fair enough. Just, yeah, it's, it's just going to be you and Clint. It's going to be me and Clint. <laughs> awkward. Awkward. Fair, yeah. 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 fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah, it's going to be a, yeah. But that that being said, though, the, the sporting analogy, yeah, I think that would be a great. You know, we could do an animated <laughs> version of it where it's like. Yeah, and, so, and here was the false start with the early SP time that got them on the road where they hit the IED that was being in place. Because of this dickhead platoon start, 10 minutes prior to 10 minutes prior to the start of the football game, uh, the so Patriots showed up three days ahead of the game. Because it was an illegal formation when Bo Birddahl took off. and <laughs> <laughs> Illegal player on the field. Yeah. An eligible receiver. Yeah, whoa. Uh, so... So, so you get these guys together and uh, and get things moving forward again. Um, and then, then this ends up being the last deployment you get out of the military yep. not so long after. Uh, so even before going on that deployment, I was like, I'm coming up on 10 years. I really Should love the Army. The but I like... That sea like, zone, that sea reenlistment I, I like, zone. Well, yeah. I like that de- Overseas army because I was very much one of those, and I'll argue with any SAR major. I mean, you laid down the resume; you were all over the place. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'll argue with any SAR major you put in front of me. There's combat soldiers and there's garrison soldiers, yep. and I love being a combat soldier. Horrible at garrison. That was the thing that scared That's... the hell out of me. As far as you know, in 2010 when I uh, left the unit that I was deploying with, it was like the whole idea was like, oh, I thought again, silly me, that the wars were winding down. Iraq, the South Agreement got signed. And we transitioned to Afghanistan. It was like, oh, Afghanistan's drawn down. I was like, man, I don't want to be a part of a garrison army. Like, that sounds like it sucks. You, you, you hear guys, from, stories from guys like you about like fucking 45-day field exercises and stuff. It's like, how do you go from combat rotations to... That doesn't seem appealing. 
And that was, I mean, I mean, the initial time coming in, I learned so much of those days of being 45 days in the field, two weeks back, 45 days out. Mm -hmm. But I also was not very appreciative of when you had command sergeant majors roll up where you're standing there in four feet of mud in the box of Honefells and says, hey, soldier, why didn't you press your uniform today? (laughs) I don't know. I haven't washed my balls in three weeks. So astute observation. Appreciate. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Appreciate your insight. Well, my boots aren't polished either because I'm in four feet of fucking mud. <laughs> yep, that'll happen when you're training for war. So you uh, you got out of the army, you made that decision, and then you uh, straight into the oil field? Yep. Um, you know, I was, I used about that last year. So I had a about a year left after getting back from that deployment to try and plan my transition out. And of course, put in for a few different jobs, um, thinking of, could get right back into government stuff, kind of recapture my time for retirement. That stuff all fell through. And of course, like anybody that's transitioned out, your fucking plan A, B, and C just sometimes don't work out. So you got to just be fluid with it. Just a note on transitioning. I think that's so important to talk about is just as far as you, you, I think it's great advice to tell guys like, yeah, have that pace plan, you know, that primary alternate contingency emergency, have that in place a hundred percent. Also, don't be surprised just like war, just like combat. If you get punched in the face as soon as you get your DD-214 in hand and that all falls to the wayside. Like, don't be surprised. You know, just because you serve doesn't mean you get given a $100,000 a year job. Um, Yeah, I think the only thing us veterans making that transition should ever get is just the opportunity to prove ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Um, And that's, like I said, I had two or three things lined up. They all fell through. It was kind of a last ditch effort to crap. I'm not going to go to college. I don't know. I've got a family and three kids. How am I going to support this? Right. Uh, yeah. You got to jump right in. Oh, it. I also, mm. so I also signed a deck statement before I got out too. Oh, What's so that? this is a decl- decline to serve. Like you're not going to, um, so you were up for seven. I take it. I got, another, the deck. I, I got a different story about that, but no, they wanted to send me to Fort Benning. And I, That's I said, the there's three, statement. three, three places I'll never get stationed in the army. And that was Fort Knox. Fort Hood and Fort Benning. And they gave me orders to Benning. And of course, I was already getting out, but I had the orders cut. So regardless, since I wasn't going to go there for my last year. So Army says like, hey, okay, we're not going to make you go there. But also, you're saying that you're done with the Army if you're not going to go there. Okay, I got you. And here's a piece of paper to sign that makes that official. And there's papers. And there's no favorable action that can go for you. Like none. Yeah. Even the, like, literally, they could look at your D214 and be like, it's, 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 it's the rules. We can't let rules. you back He, in. he yeah. signed it. Yeah. <laughs> Joke's on them. Got a pretty good favorable action a <laughs> yeah. little bit later and you, on. And, you, and then you got, and then you have a and nice life now. I have right? a great life. Yeah. yeah. I haven't been to your house yet. Why not? I mean, I'm too much of a pussy to just show up. I need you to invite me. You're, and not North, because I North just Dakota. Not because I just invited. put that Everybody's on you. Invited. Like, I, well, I, I don't want you to invite me now. I want you to like call me up randomly like three weeks from now I'm like Jack I invite you to my house you know I want it to feel organic I'm gonna send you a personalized stationery formally like requesting I look, well I still owe you you and you and the lady two hundred dollars from the hockey no we're game. going to we're gonna go to the Dallas Stars and wear a North Stars oh yeah. yeah wait so I'll take care of those tickets yeah because those tickets are like two hundred dollars right now because of COVID so yeah wait how what well, it's just expensive to get into a hockey game. Do now. they only let you up in the nosebleed? It's like twenty five percent capacity, so they. But you can't be on the, the ice. Of it. You can't be yeah, on the you glass. Can, can you pound the glass? Uh, yeah. Um, the the whole stadium it's just spread out. It's weird. It's like looking at. Uh, I don't know how to make the analogy. It's just it's they are, they're letting people in the game, but it's like twenty five percent capacity. So tickets are hard. Come down to come down to Dallas, and we're gonna we're gonna go see the stars. Yeah, I, on me, so I can make up for like. I've owed you two hundred dollars for like over two years now. Yeah, but that that Vegas night game was. I mean, the pageantry that, of that the was, start was. Oh my gosh! Yeah, since we're all here in South yeah. Dakota right now, we're in the we're, upper Midwest. We could just we're, spend the rest of the show talking about hockey. Fucking hockey. Could, could, or Fuck. we could we could jump straight to the guy goes to Kosovo, <laughs> Korea, Iraq, Afghanistan. He's like, well, North Dakota is a natural next choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I like I like seeing places I never thought I'd be. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so, so all my plans fell through. I realized I wasn't going to go to college. I got a seven or twelve percent in high school English and failed that. Um, 
my brother-in-law had been working the oil fields for years. And of course, he'd tell me, hey, get out of the army. There's work. There's work. As long as yeah, you as can- As long as you're not a complete bozo, as you'll long, excel. He literally said, as long as you can fog a mirror and have like just that much common sense, you know, you, you can make it. That Bach and Shale was like- And of course, timing is, timing is yeah, everything. They were looking for people. So that 2011, that was yep. booming. I got out. Started my terminal leave in January, went up there in early February, uh, got on with the company that my brother-in-law was working at, started working the hydro excavator truck being literally, that's the other thing like that irritates me sometimes with, with veterans making the transition that think they need that top tier job. You're going to something new. You got to yeah. start somewhere. And I was literally the low man on the totem pole taking that wand and turning dirt into mud and sucking it up through a high pressure vacuum thing to find oil lines. Yeah. It's like, by the way, just, that doesn't apply just to veterans. It's just anybody yeah, yeah. who, if you decide to up and switch careers There's, one day, yeah. you, you, you gotta, don't just get to automatically. You don't get to slip into the top slots. Yeah. You got to you pay your work. dues. And that's what really kind of solidified it for me was the fact that I went there, started off doing that job, went and got my CDL, uh, commercial driver's license, and then. Three months, I was the swapper to the driver, driving a driving a truck. Um, six months later, I was managing eight of them. Yeah. You know. Speaks to, give me an opportunity. Yep. Just let me show yep. my worth. Yep. I, I don't know anything about the oil fields other than, mm -hmm. you know. Well, it's good I, that you went in there with that kind of humility. Unfortunately, what I've, I've been around, I've no, I was going to say, we, we have getting shot in base training in common. You two have the oil field in common. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I was just going to say with veterans, I've watched a lot of veterans not approach going into the private sector with any humility. And there is a certain entitlement amongst oh. a good portion of veterans. And that's how they get angry. And like, why don't I have why this? I'm like, yeah. buddy, you're 22 years old and you were in the infantry. Oof. You don't have any marketable skills. Go to college, or if you're going to start a trade, start learning. Yep. Yeah. You, you, I don't right. give a shit that you're a squad leader. It doesn't mean dick. I mean, yeah. there, there's a lot of things that transfer over. You know, the attention to detail, the following right. rules and regulations. But nothing on paper. Those but are all no, intangibles. That yep. Your there, there's nothing see. direct. Like, yeah, yeah when you're, you're combat arms making that direct transition, it's like, oh, uh, I, I can be a tangent here, too, by the way. I and I know like the A cap classes, like the transition classes that they do when you're, they're like, oh, you need to translate your military skills and put job titles that make sense to That's civilians. I look at those res, and it's, maybe it's because I do understand the real titles, and I was from I don't know, but you look at those and they are so fucking cringy. It's like the the comparisons that like mid level manager at you're responsible for forty two million dollars worth of equipment. You're like, <laughs> like it's, just, you're it's like putting. The powdered worst, sugar on a doctor. Yeah. The just worst like, dude, resume just, <laughs> I ever looked at was a dude that uh, all he put on under his military experience. I don't know. Like, how do you think this was going to get you a job, bro? All he put on it was combat action ribbon. <laughs> no. That's all, that's all you need to know about that's, me. That's exactly what this is. That's all like, you need to know about combat. me. combat. Now hire me. I'm great for this job. Bitch, you're full in t-shirts, man. We don't give a shit that you saw also, combat. I don't know like what the qualification is for a Marine to get a, a car, but I know like for the Army, for like the CIV, CAV, it's like combat is a pretty wide... It's, it's the same in the Marine Corps, but it's not even that. Yeah. It's just like, that's your, that's your selling point. It's, combat action. Right there, there's like the Clint Romache, Romache version of combat, and then there's also the... I was standing in line at the on base Taco hey, Bell, Bell and hey. IDF hit like I got a question for you. You're the only you're one of the only guys I know with a medal that you get to wear around your neck. Uh, can I get like a National Defense Service medal that made up to where I can wear it around my neck? I, I, I'm not a hundred percent sure of what I know. The it's not your call. Military awards and decorations. I assume that as an NCO in the United States Army, you would just, know I want all a neck the medal. I, I would think those suspenders. Oh, a suspender medal. Oh, the National Defense Ribbon suspenders. suspenders that and they're like, those are cool sweet. suspenders. Like, no, it's no. a medal. Respect my value. If, yeah. if you knew. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'd do that. I'd be the first guy with suspender medals. That would be great. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to get working on that. Who do, who do I call? Vanguard? I don't know how that works. Go to the PX. Ask for a special order. Okay. All right. All right. Oh. Yeah. You know what? We're living in the Etsy age. I can have anything yeah. made. By the way, notable medal you received. 
Is it kind of weird that you're like, oh, but I'm already out of the army. So like, I guess, you know. Yeah, it was super awkward. You know, you're like, I, I don't know. What do I do with it? I know there's like special rules for the Medal of Honor. But like, it's still, it's like, I'm not in, I'm not actively wearing my uniform or class A's anymore at this point. So, you so, know. So again, I was, I was not the best garrison soldier um, at all. And never in my 12 years of military service was my class A's ever. Yeah. And because yeah, you, sounds like you were changing duty stations every year and a half. Yeah. And, oh man, you were probably one of those dudes that was psyched that we went to Velcro. As often as you were changing, like for the unit patch. Oh yeah, that got Instead expensive. Getting sewn, you know? Yeah. So, so I went when I went to DC. Um, I I got to go sit and have a office call with a uh, command sergeant major of the army at the time, Chandler. Mm-hmm. I had one of the greatest conversations I've ever had with the command sergeant major. Um, and he looked at me, and he's like, "Hey, Sergeant Romache, you know, twelve years in, eight more to retirement. What do you think about coming back in?" Nah, if I could go back overseas. And he's like, well, that's not going to happen. Um, you know, we've been looking through your files and stuff. Do you have a copy of your DA photo? I was like, well, no. <laughs> he's like, well, we can't find one. And I'm like, well, yeah, it probably doesn't exist. Like, Why not? You got looked at seven three times. And I'm like, yeah, well, I knew I'd never get promoted to seven if I never took one. <laughs> and the look and on his face chestnut checkers um, <laughs> do we have just, to give you this medal of just that no I was totally content with being an E6 <laughs> and I never wanted to get my class A uniform that's a guy who's probably a motivator from day one yeah. right no yeah. like a, you're just two different types of soldiers yeah yeah, yeah. And, I, and I doubt that there's anything wrong with a guy but you, you thought just, differently yeah, yeah. And, and so when it came time to actually receive mm-hmm. the medal they're of course, I'd been out for almost two years, and it's like, "Hey, would you wear the uniform?" And of course, I'm like, ah, I, I don't. And it feels like doesn't not, it feel awkward it, though to be like, I'm out, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm, "I'm out of the I'm army, out of the army." I've got a sweet mustache that'll yeah. have to trim down. I haven't got a haircut, and in fact, I don't even really know how to set up my uniform. Uh, so I told them did I you had would. to go on YouTube or something. Oh, I did one better. I said I will wear it if you get the old guard to set it up for me. Oh, so it was pristine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And it hasn't been out of the bag since. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. That well, came yeah, out. Because you did, you did media tours, but they were within like 48 the, hours. Yeah, of, right. Immediately afterwards. And that's mm. nuts that one minute you're working on, you're doing the standard oil dude stuff. And, stuff, and, all and I'm sure, I, obviously you didn't forget, but you had obviously taken well, your next steps. You just, were thinking for the future. And next thing you know, uh, you're... You're with the president of the United States and you're on national television. And But you weren't the first person in your family on national television. I, I was not, unfortunately. No. You got beat. My, my dad beat me. Yeah. And he, well, I hope not. I hope your dad didn't beat you, but well, yeah. I mean, he beat me on TV. Yes, he beat you on TV. And he was, so was you You were with Letterman, but your dad yeah. was. Yeah, well, my dad went, oh, yeah. But if in the 90s, if you don't remember. Donahue. The, Donahue was a huge name. Huge. His dad was on Donahue. Yeah, I told you even before. Yeah. Well, Donahue was pre Oprah, even. Yeah, he was like the original yeah. uh, daytime talk show host. So yeah, sitting there, and all of a sudden, national TV. But of course, Dad already beat me to yeah. it. That back in the the early nineties, when this family that was trying to head home on Christmas break or vacation or whatever tried to cut through, that's how rural our part of Northern California and Northern Nevada is. They tried to cut through there, going up to Idaho. And got lost and stuck out in a massive snowstorm. Um, and my dad was one of the people that found the Stolpa family. And there's a great movie called, a made-for-TV movie called Snowbound. Where Doogie Howser in it. Neil Patrick Harris yeah, plays man, I remember watching Mr. That. Stolpa. Yeah. Um, and my dad worked on the Washoe County uh, road crew that found him. Um, rescued uh, the, the mom and the baby. Uh, his boss had found uh, the husband. But yeah, next thing we know, he's... Uh, he gets to go to New York first. Yeah. He gets to get picked and up. You, and you you weren't, in, in you, a weren't limo. From, you weren't from a big you're from a small town and your dad's on national television. He's on Donahue. Yeah, on Donahue. Yeah. And like I'm pretty sure we still got the VHS recording. Yeah, that, you gotta get that transfer to DVD. That we had to go into town and have actually one of our friends record it because we didn't have cable. <laughs> I know that life. I know the yeah. bunny your life well. 
<laughs> we, we did have a satellite, but like not one of those DSS. We had like the big Galaxy 3 that shifted and then dad made sure the tree was in the way yeah. so you can, couldn't get the porn channels. But uh, Smart thinking because back it was, it was the scrambled era back then. Yeah. If you got mm-hmm. the little magic card or whatever, you could descramble or the scramble oh, box. That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> oh, man. Well, yeah. I mean, we were talking, I mean, without going into detail, we were talking about uh, for us as young uh, young men, it's a, it was a different time back then in the 90s, uh, uh, you know, when we were coming of age. Access to information just wasn't was. No. What no. wasn't is what it is today. I have the Sears catalog, bra section. I'll never forget it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Frederick's <laughs> of Hollywood. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. I'm sorry, man. I took us all off track. Yeah, what were you? We're all thinking about the Johnny Hill catalog. Yeah, right now. now. Laundry section. Oh, yeah. And, and, yeah. 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 Oof. Yeah. The 90s. 90s. Hell of yeah. a decade. Uh, yeah, so you go on national television. You do this whirlwind media tour. Do you just get to go back to being like, hey, I'm going to go back to work now? Is you know, this done? Or That's one of the great things I loved about going to North Dakota is the, the Clint that went up there in 2011. Hmm. And the Clint that received the medal in 2013 got treated the exact same by mm-hmm. that community. Uh, yeah. And I, I'm just so appreciative of that. Like, it was the exact same. And I mean, that's why I love it up there. That's why I love the Midwest. Mm-hmm. It's just a, a great mentality. You can be exactly who you are. I can play and pull tabs too- and I can drink too much bush light yeah. at a bar. And no one's going to, you know, that's what we do sometimes. Yeah. I mean, it seems like you had a pretty good gig. You were able to just shoot down here to go, you know, fish with us for uh, for the week. And, you know, man, I, I remember I got- one of the first times I talked to you, I think you had just recently done a hunt in Tajikistan or something like that for a big ram. Like, it seems like you're still doing some pretty cool stuff. It was actually, that was... So I'm pretty informal, though, because, yeah, the first time we met, I was yeah. actually down in San Antonio with a nonprofit. And I had, like, four hours mm-hmm. to kind of kill. And I'm like... There's people down here. I think I know. Oh, Black Rifle's yeah. down here. Yeah. And I got yeah. Ubered and just ran over real quick to pop in and literally just say hi. Um, and then, of course, apparently you guys were a little up. So why didn't you tell us you're coming down? I'm like, well, I'm an idiot. And I just, I don't make any solid plans. I just show up. And yeah. I think when, that's kind of the cool part about Black Rifle, though, is the impromptu drop-ins that happen happens there. All the, yeah. And they're like, you know, the most incredible people. We're just all like, yeah, we'll go fucking figure. Well, he's, if you go to the Black Rifle office yeah. in San Antonio there, he's one of the only people that has his face up on the wall there. To Like, they hung it up as soon as they got. Like, the place is well-decorated. Yeah. yeah. It's well yeah. feng shui. They put thought into it. There's this random picture of Clint on this wall with no other pictures. And it's like, big. it's like poorly placed. If there's no symmetry to it whatsoever, <laughs> but it's a random screenshot of Clint on Instagram. <laughs> I don't know why it's there's probably an inside thing with Evan or something, but it's still there. Out of all the fancy decorating they've done around that yeah. office, if you walk down the Black Rifle Halls, there's just a random picture of Clint that doesn't make any sense that it's And it's there. not even a mug shot. That's what's impressive. No, it's, yeah, right. It, no, <laughs> they took a screenshot from Instagram <laughs> and it's framed on the wall. <laughs> Like next to all, you know, all Black Rifles awards and everything like that. Yeah, it's a it's a cool place. I mean, that so I met you, yeah, kind of pretty informally there. I remember that day I happened to be in town, uh, and I remember they just pop in. They're like, "Hey, Clint Romer stays here. Can you interview him real quick?" I'm like, you know, token fucking journalist dude there. So it's like, oh yeah, just I'll just whip a fucking interview out of my ass real quick with a Medal of Honor recipient. Yeah. No big deal. And so I do the most basic fucking R11 questions in a cup of coffee interview with them. But uh, it was actually, I think the more memorable time I got to know you a little bit better is, man, I got to say, if you're coming to San Antonio, you do not get to experience proper San Antonio unless you do it with Jack Mandeville. Jack oh, Mandeville knows oh. San Antonio. Yeah. Um, I have a low self-esteem. I don't take compliments well, but I agree with you. I, I, am, I know my city. Yeah, I cannot recommend getting to know San Antonio through anybody else besides Jack. And uh, so on one particular night, we went out. It was, San Antonio's got kind of a cool vibe. They got, Especially in the summertime, they got these places where they set out just like lawn chairs and stuff like that. You just go up, order beer, take a sixer back to your table and, you know. Just hang out and bullshit. Yeah, it's super cool. It's like, in, in like neighborhoods, you yeah. know, it, it's great. But anyways, yeah, we went out drinking one night with yeah. Jack, you, me, and uh, I don't remember. 
exactly. Well, Logan came out that yeah, night. Logan I think. Was out oh, yeah. For yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. It was it was great, but it was like it's kind of cool, man. And that's why one of the things I, I love about you and respect about you is like, hey, man, you yeah, you've had some like significant things happen as far as like being a Medal of Honor recipient, you know, the book, all these other yeah. things that have happened. Man, you're a fucking chill guy to just go hang out with. You fit. I am so glad that you ended up in one of the Dakotas because, man, <laughs> we got to shoot right some in. pheasants Salt to today. The we got to spear Salt some to the fish guy. today. Yeah. Oh, by the way, Red puts in. We never said the name of my Yeah, book. so the, yeah, we got to make sure. Yeah. Uh, if you'd like to know more uh, about the vague things that we were talking about earlier as far as uh, uh, Clint's last yeah. deployment, it, it's... I mean, it's your book. I'm not going to plug it for you. I already said it. Though. Oh, Red Platoon. Yeah. yeah, Red Platoon. Red Platoon by Clint Romasha. Forward by, I don't remember who the forward by. Who's the forward by? I don't know. For, uh, forward by um, Scott Johansson. Yeah, that sounds good. Well, hey, I think that, I mean, this is probably a good place. Like, go buy the book. Let's give people a chance to get off this podcast and go buy your book. And that was your um, chance to tell that story well, yeah. from your heart and how you wanted to. And, yeah. and what makes... What I'm truly proud about that book is the guys I served with that were willing to be interviewed and allow their story to be captured. And one of the greatest compliments I've ever got with people that have read that book is when they look at me and they say, well, what did you do that day? And to me, that means so much that, yeah. you know, Bunderman gets acknowledged, Larson, Raz, the eight great guys we lost. I um, read it, but the first, before I read it, I flipped straight to the picture section and it's got great pictures too. Yeah. Well, of course, because uh, I'm 12% in English. And I'm like, if we put the pictures in sequence with what we're talking about, I can just flip to it and kind of guess what's going on. I can just imagine sitting down with the publisher and you're going through like the breakdown of the book. And I'm like, well, I just, before we get into all the word stuff, I want to focus on the picture section first. Uh, you should have I really seen, think we should leave with this uh, one. Uh, yeah, you should have seen our working titles. Look, man, I didn't get an MFA from Northern Iowa. Uh, just, you know, how can we incorporate the pictures into my, <laughs> my story? Yeah. Can we, can we give crayons out with each book? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, go by Red Platoon. Uh, you know, big shout out to the, the Stefan Brothers Outfitters out here in Pier that are putting us up out in their lodge right now. Taking us out on the yeah. ice. And Red Horse. Red Horse, the greatest unit in the Air Force. And Red Horse. Yeah. Uh, you know, we got some, we got some great gear that has been getting out by Everly Stock and Beyond Clothing and a bunch of places we're drinking that Black Rifle Coffee. Yeah, it's 20 below zero and we got that hot good good from yeah. Black Rifle Coffee in there. I don't want to drag this long, but I, I will say like, yeah, I'm a regular coffee drinker. I'm obviously I'm drinking the product, uh, but I've never appreciated. I mean, obviously oh. we've been we've been drinking Black Rifle, but just in a general sense, having a hot cup of coffee. I don't remember a time in my life where mm-hmm. I appreciated a hot cup of coffee so much as as, uh, as coming off shack. this morning yeah, coming at, off yeah. the ice at on negative ice. twenty oh, yeah that's yeah. yeah it's a game changer so uh, yeah anyways hey you know this is free range American and uh, yeah thanks for coming on. Clint. <laughs>